Aïn Amrata Oh, ça y est. Elle peut arriver. Mais oui, elle est là. Aïn Amrata Hi, how are you, Vincent <laughs> Fine, fine, fine. Everybody is here. Oh, Maria is here too. Hi, Maria. <laughs> So, so, so we are expecting you. We are very happy to be with you from New York, from Japan. And uh, what do you say? Just give the, 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 give the micro to Namrata. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I, um, I can't quite tell who is in the room, but I think uh, we, oh, wow, yes. <laughs> Amazing. Wow, quite a big gathering. <laughs> It's wonderful to see you all at least uh, virtually. Um, thank you so much for making the time. I know it's the end of the week, so you must be quite tired. Um, so I have been, uh, so I'm Namrita Sharma, and I work for the State University of New York. And uh, my, uh, you know, research interests are uh, Soka Ikeda Studies in Education and Global Citizenship Education and Sustainable Development. Um, including ESD, which is Education for Sustainable Development. So uh, without further ado, I'll just get into my presentation and I hope that we can have a fantastic dialogue today. So um, I'm going to use from the uh, time allocated to me, I'm going to use um, you know, about 20 to 25 minutes uh, to show you a film. Um, and before and after the film, I'll just share some reflections uh, on the topic uh, of the seminar today. And I have uh, this noted on my uh, laptop. So I'm going to, uh, you know, read my reflections from the laptop and then show you my, uh, this film from, uh, you know, streaming it from, from my laptop. And I hope uh, it'll, you know, uh, be easy to access at your end. So, you know, the title of the symposium today is uh, The Keys to an Effective Dialogue for World Peace in an International Context of Competition. Um, so it's a big topic, um, and I suppose, you know, you have uh, had some chance to reflect on it, uh, you know, from the time you've uh, got together today at five o'clock or before the uh, seminar, and I'm sorry, it's uh, unusual not to get a chance to interact with you, but, uh, um, you know, I'm going to anyway start by sharing my reflections, and then hopefully there will be, uh, you know, these interactions that follow uh, later on. So uh, let me start by sharing some reflections on the notion of competition as developed by the Soka progenitor. So the word competition is you know, integral to today's uh, seminar topic. And I want to uh, you know, seize the opportunity to share some thoughts on uh, the three Soka progenitors, Maki Gucci, Toda, and Ikeda's views on the topic of competition. So, um, You know, Maki Gucci, who is the first Soka progenitor, he uses the term humanitarian competition in his 1903 work, The Geography of Human Life. And many of uh, you here may have already, uh, you know, read this work of his. This was actually Maki Gucci's uh, first major work. And one of the vital aspects of this work is Makiguchi's reflection on some of the main forms or in which nations compete with each other. So in the early 20th century, Makiguchi was reflecting on how you know, nations tend to compete with each other. And what he found was that you know, the, the predominant mode of competition between nation states across the world have changed over a period of time. So he finds that uh, you know there was a time period in which the predominant mode of competition was uh, between nation states was militaristic you know so nations fought battles and wars to really compete with each other then makiguchi notes that uh, this predominant you know way of like fighting wars as a way of competing with each other between nations gave uh, way to a more political form of competition You know, and I think he's right, of course, you know, when we look at the British Raj or the British rule and the colonization of various nation states across the world, you know, uh, we can see that um, during that uh, time period in history, the predominant mode of competition was a political one. But then Makiguchi notes, you know, and this is in the early 20th century, he says, and he kind of, in a sense, um, foresees 
that the predominant mode of competition in the 21st century is going to be an economic one. And that is really an astute observation. So, you know, um, I think looking again, you know, at what Makiguchi uh, meant by the term humanitarian competition, um, I think it needs much more reflection, but some initial thoughts that I have on this is that what he really envisaged is that whereas you know nation states might still uh, continue to compete with each other and we might see you know the uh, wars uh, continuing to happen we might see political domination and of course economic uh, competition but there may be a time in which you know nation states get to uh, you know working with each other in a more a humanitarian way. So there is a humanitarian framework within which the competition takes place. So what does that mean? To me, it means that even though, for example, uh, nation states might continue to compete with each other, let's say in economic terms, there is a humanitarian framework with, within which the competition takes place. So Ikeda, who is the you know third Soka progenitor, explains that because of the interrelatedness and interdependence of human communities, a sustainable gain is only when it benefits others as well. So what Ikeda says is that Makikuchi might be hoping that nation states get to this you know, humanitarian um, framework where they can attempt to achieve personal benefit for the nation, but also in a way that benefits others. So Makiguchi acknowledged that it would take time for humankind to reach this goal. To me, the question that arises, you know, when I read on the topic of uh, humanitarian competition as ex expounded by Makiguchi, to me, the question that arises is that, you know, how are we going to achieve this almost, um, you know, kind of uh, idealistic dream, right? So as a Soka scholar, you know, uh, um, an investigation into the Soka paradigm, I think, suggests that the transformation of a nation can only truly take place if the citizens of the nations achieve an inner transformation. You know, so a revolution in the life of the individual can lead to the transformation of the nation state and the world. So further, such human transformation could make it possible you know, through this uh, relentless uh, self-reflection that the citizens uh, go through or the inner dialogue, you know, within citizens' lives themselves, such human transformation could make it possible for, a, you know, a critical threshold to be reached in which maybe not all the, you know, citizens of a nation state uh, transform in a constructive way, but there is a critical threshold that allows for many, if not most people in nation states across the world to achieve this human transformation through self-reflection and dialogue where they can embrace uh, you know, the sufferings of others and include others in their own sort of profit-making um, you know, uh, tasks. So again, you know, Makiguchi's vision is certainly an ideal one, but um, you know, again, um, if we look at uh, the movements initiated by thinkers such as Makiguchi or others such as the Indian leader Mahatma Gandhi, whose work I have been also engaged in for a while, I think we can find hope that the goal of humanitarian competition could become a possibility in the future. So again, not all people in every nation state transforming, but in most nation states, a great deal of people, uh, you know, transforming through the self-reflective process. So uh, in my work on the Indian independence movement led by Mahatma Gandhi, I find a lot of hope uh, through this study that individual change at a certain moment in history uh, could be made possible, could also lead to a social transformation. So it is possible, you know, for individual uh, change uh, within a certain mass polity to uh, lead to a transformation of the nation. But of course, you know, uh, focusing on the unit of transformation being that of the individual and not the nation. So the micro level uh, looking at, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, transformation to take place. So, okay, so those are some very brief initial reflections. Um, I want to move on now to show you a film. Um, this is a film that is based on an essay written by Dr. Daisaku Ikeda. It is titled Another Way of Seeing Things. Um, and in this uh, essay, Dr. Ikeda narrates the work of Dr. Arnold Toynbee, a British historian, and Toynbee's report on the state of the Turkish people during a time in which the Turks and Muslims were vilified in many parts of Europe. So in this essay, Ikeda challenges media stereotyping and how this can give rise to prejudice and barriers between people of different nationalities and religions. So this essay written by Dr. Ikeda is, uh, you know, is, trans is made into a film. And this film is narrated by Murray Abraham, who is the, um, an American actor and Academy Award winner. And I show this film actually every semester to my students, uh, you know, and I encourage them to view the film as a text, you know, for critical textual analysis. So um, I apologize that the quality of this, uh, you know, film is not very good. It's from an old CD, which I had to, um, you know, burn through. Don't ask me how I was able to do that. Um, so I apologize for the quality of the film, but the audio is pretty clear. And I hope uh, you, know, you can go past that um, visual uh, sort of delay, but really focus on the very invaluable words of this essay narrated through this film. So um, I don't know if it makes sense for you to turn off your video, but I'm going to turn off my video while I uh, show you this film, just so that I have enough bandwidth at my end um, to show you in, in the video in its best quality possible. So if it's okay, can I do that now, Alex? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. Sherry. We'll Thank do you. the same. Perfect. Hey. I'll give you a minute to turn your video back on again. Great. So I guess um, some of you might have already seen this film, right? Um, how many have already seen this film? The room, not many. Okay, great. Perfect. I'm glad it wasn't. And I hope you could see it properly, right? Okay, great. Perfect. Perfect. So, um, you know, and I want to really thank, I mean, I, I thanked everyone, but I want to especially thank uh, Alex and Vincent, you know, for making this seminar possible today. I know with, you know, doing this um, in a hybrid fashion is especially quite challenging. So uh, let me share some more uh, thoughts and then, you know, if we have some time, we can uh, get into discussion. But of course, you know, the end of the day has also uh, allowed, allotted some time for, uh, you know, further reflections and discussions amongst us. So I hope you enjoyed the film. I hope, uh, you know, it allowed you to really think reflectively. It certainly, uh, every time I see it, it stirs inside me a very sort of, um, a passionate response to, uh, you know, to to how uh, my own inner transformation can contribute to a positive transformation of this world. My favorite quote from Ikeda in this film is as follows. Um, he says that the growth and development of mass media has actually increased the danger of proliferating stereotypes and ready-made images. We are all exposed to these risks. It is vital that each of us ask some important questions. Do I accept without questioning the images shown to me? Do I believe unconfirmed reports without first examining them? Have I unwittingly allowed myself to become prejudiced? Do I really have a grasp of the matters of the, of the facts of the matter? Do I really have a grasp of the facts of the matter? Have I confirmed these things for myself? Have I gone to the scene? Have I met the people involved? Have I listened to what they have to say? Am I being swayed by malicious rumors? I believe that this kind of inner dialogue is crucial, unquote. I think the question, you know, that we need to ask is, how can we act based on inner dialogue or self-reflection? 
And, you know, in light of that, I think perhaps the theme for today's seminar could also explore how inner dialogue can become a precursor to facilitate humanitarian competition. So we, you know, we as citizens um, of our respective nation states, you know, how can we usher in this humanitarian competition that is, an, of course, an idealistic uh, vision of Mr. Maki Gucci, but how can we facilitate this humanitarian competition between our nation states and other nation states through our own inner dialogue and self-reflective process? So, um, you know, of course, there are some goals that are transcending, you know, uh, that, that nation states had across the world have committed to. And those, as I think all of us here uh, know of, um, include the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, you know. Um, and through my work in the field of education for sustainable development and global citizenship, I use my, um, you know, studies uh, from the SOCA uh, paradigm to develop a creative process of thinking, acting, and being a value-creating global citizen. So value-creating global citizen can aim to contribute to the welfare of others and oneself. And this is possible through reflective thinking. So what are some of the practical ways in which, you know, we can strive to become a value creating global citizen. And here are three things which I'd like to share today. Uh, the first is to become an inclusive citizen. So can we move to read, listen and experience what is beyond our usual spectrum of engagements? I find that I usually go back to the same type of podcast, same type of reading, same type of, uh, you know, same kind of author and literature that I'm used to reading. But can I expand beyond that to include, um, you know, my sort of reading, listening and experiencing um, of other uh, sort of diverse perspectives? Can we push ourselves to, um, you know, become inclusive citizens who can especially understand the views of those who are very different from us? So, um, in this regard, uh, Dr. Ikeda, you know, in his 2018 peace proposal, um, suggests that in this age of technology, we are faced with what has been termed as the filter bubble. So he says that data searches that return information already attuned to the user's preferences obscure other sources. So what does that mean? It means that, you know, when I go on the internet and I search for data, particularly to do with, let's say, political news, it is most likely that I will get that type of feed that I am used to uh, reading. What is troubling about this phenomena, Ikeda mentions, is the degree to which it impacts a person's understanding of social issues. So when we search the inf internet uh, for any information, it is most likely that we will get more of the political views or news that we are accustomed to. So what is the you know, net sort of effect of this? One of the consequences of this is the widening gap between people and the divisive politics across nation states. And I think the US exemplifies this in the growing divide between Democrats and Republicans. So such divisive politics can negatively impact you know, this common goal that uh, we have as, as human uh, global citizens of the sustainable development goals. You know, this divisive politics across and within nation states can make the, uh, they make the um, you know, the, the uh, achievement of the SDGs or sustainable development goals uh, less likely. So we really need dialogue and consensus. So this is my first point, you know, so how can we become more inclusive citizens? The second practical reflection that I'd like to make is that of becoming a creative citizen. So one of the critiques of education that is informed by a neoliberal paradigm is that we are educating for individual profit rather than truly educating for global citizenship that can nurture individuals who can contribute to the benefit of self and others. This is a human right. You know, so how can we become creative citizens, you know, who can really, uh, um, you know, sort of 
include and embrace the suffering of others, starting from, of course, our immediate environment. And finally, can we also become more active citizens? So in engaging with our own local and global community, there are a variety of ways in which we can achieve the sustainable development goals as an active citizen. Um, I would suggest, uh, you know, uh, for myself, of course, is to uh, start from my immediate environment, you know, so for example, uh, to question myself, um, whether the clothing that I'm wearing, you know, is sustainable, uh, or can I identify human rights abuses, uh, you know, connected to connecting to um, the clothes and other items uh, and articles that I consume on a daily basis. So these are the kind of critical questions, you know, to ask myself about my daily life that um, the kind of articles and, and uh, uh, items that I consume on a daily basis, uh, does the manufacturing and selling of it infringe on the human rights of others? These are the kind of questions, of course, that I also propose through my work uh, to help communities uh, think and discuss local and global issues. And of course, this inner dialogue is the first step. I think, to becoming a global citizen and achieving common uh, you know, world goals such as the SDGs. So, um, of course, you know, there is a broad uh, variety of literature on the, con on the topic of dialogue within the Soka Ikeda corpus, um, especially within the Anglophone literature. And I situate my work within that. Uh, but I'm going to stop here. So we get about 20 minutes uh, to interact with each other. And, uh, you know, again, thank you so much for being here on a Friday uh, evening and uh, Saturday morning in, in Tokyo. And I'm really looking forward to the rest of the evening with the end morning with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nam Namrata, so much. So let's say that one question from the room is to develop some fundamental idea about uh, what sensitivity may be talking about that, to, to, how to become sensitive, strong inside and look at the humanity as something it's impossible not to consider the richness of humanity. And when you have this feeling, it's, I, I think it's a good starting point. For me, at least, and it's join what you say about the inner revolution, inner transformation, universality from inside and then spreading to outside. So I don't know if we can start from that to base. If someone wants, Alex, maybe Maria. Someone want to break the ice. You are, we, we are in Quebec, so it's time to break the ice. Thank you. And could I see, uh, Vincent, would it be possible to lower the uh, laptop a little bit? Then I can see, at least try and see um, faces from a distance. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. So nice to have the personal interaction. <laughs> okay. So, Hello. Hey, how are you? Thank you so I'm much. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I would want you, to, it's not really a question, but maybe just um, uh, try to explain a little bit more what you uh, were trying to say with the critical threshold of people in any nation uh, that can bring forward towards a true inner transformation, this humanitarian competition. What would be uh, like a global idea of this critical threshold and where such people should act to uh to change the the actual way that we compete uh between nations towards a humanitarian competition perfect thank you. thank you so much that's a that's a brilliant question so you know that's why um i have been so interested in um engaging with gandhian studies because to me, it uh, as a Soka scholar, Gandhian studies gives me a good idea of what are these uh, visions that the three Soka progenitors, you know, are talking about. So, if uh, we introspect, you know, the Satyagraha movement, you know, the nonviolent movement for Indian independence led by Mahatma Gandhi in India, right? At what point 
at what time or point in history was did it become a tipping point so the battle for indian independence was going on for you know more than a century when gandhi came into the picture right but gandhi turned it into this real non violent movement not that there weren't other non violent leaders but gandhi managed to galvanize people um and so it reached this particular point a tipping point you know for the indian satyagraha movement where the british had to sort of declare okay this is it we got to pack and leave so what determines that i don't know that i would necessarily be able to answer that i'm not even sure that a historian might be able to say that but there are you know such tipping points uh, if you look at the kenyan green belt movement led by wangari mathai you know there as well there is this tipping point where you know the women are totally anxious you know especially the women the, the people in general but the kenyan uh, you know women especially had this economic anxiety social anxiety and then they had this dictatorial political regime that uh, was stopping them from achieving you know a certain minimum level of income and livelihood so then uh, mathai started to galvanize their values you know their ethical moral uh, sort of stance and said no we will fight this through our beliefs and their marches you know wangari wangari mathai's marches or the kenyan grain belt movement marches to me is very much like the salt uh, march of mahatma gandhi in 1930 in which these people are walking you know in in the case of kenya they are carrying these saplings in their hand and in the case of the indian satyagrahis they are carrying salt in their hand and they are walking to really you know marching towards their own independence and success to me this is the tipping point we don't know when that tipping point might come you know we see the three soka thinkers and uh, dr riketa especially has achieved so much in his lifetime um so for me as a as a soka uh, educator you know um how much more can i give of my time to uh, talking about soka education to engaging with young scholars to learning from them to having this dialogue i think in that pursuit in that pursuit is where we can really um hope for that tipping point to come within our communities our nation states and the world at large i don't know if it directly responds to your question but uh, this is my reflection on this topic I have a question. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question pertains to um, the concept of inner dialogue. Uh, being a philosophy major myself, um, the 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 concept of inner dialogue um, relates a little bit to Socrates and Plato, with Socrates and his inner demon, and how the pure activity of reason in the dialogue. Do you think they took inspiration? Uh, uh, Daisy Kuekeda or Makiguchi took inspiration from this ancient Greek philosophy, or is it the fact that dialogue is very universal and they just uh, uh, ended up with the same conclusion? So that was my my question. That's a brilliant question. Can I have your Jeremy. name, please? Jeremy. Jeremy, hi, Jeremy. That's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> I love that question. Um, that's a great question because, of course, you know. Um, as as uh, homo sapiens as human beings right we we talk we communicate we dialogue but i love that question also because um so in my work i try to bring about the confluence in diverse perspectives but i also try to hone out what are the eastern ontological perspectives on which ikeda's ideas are based right so ikeda's concept of dialogue of course um you know borrows from the western thinkers you know um as well as martin buber and others you know contemporaries but he is oh, he is based his his soka paradigm to me is primarily based on this eastern ontological understanding that uh, is you know from his buddhist uh, view of uh, self and other and he looks at the inextricable link between the self and the other which is why his notion of dialogue moves between human and human to human and nature and then we read the phrase dialogue with nature in his work and that comes from his 
Eastern ontological understanding. So I think what is important in uh, in the very uh, you know uh, sort of uh, amazing question, Jeremy, that you asked, is to go back and look at paradigms. Why that is important is because in the view to make us all equal, we can sometimes assimilate ideas that are di diverse. So we need diversity to also reflect and something which I always have a, an issue with in the US. The US is, it's diverse, but it's so similar. Whereas I lived in Europe for 10 years and Europe is diverse, but you can see, feel and, and hear the diversity, right? So we need to be able to see the confluences in perspectives, but we also need to be able to go back to looking at what are the specific um, ontological paradigms. And, and in this film, Ikeda says, there is an African view, you know, there is an Asian view. He's not saying that, uh, that within Asia, there is not an African view. You know, he's not saying that there is this um, like strand, strands of threads, you know, we are, we are very, comp there's a complex um, ways in which we are interwoven in society. He's, he's saying that that is true, but then there are these diverse perspectives that we need to be mindful of as well. So thank you so much. That's a brilliant question. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, I have a question as well. Um, in best case scenarios, you know, every nation would try this, uh, this concept of uh, Dr. Ikeda of uh, humanitarian development. Um, but what happens if we're kind of the only nations that look into this concept, you know, wouldn't that make us vulnerable on like, um, you know, to enter into conflicts and such things, you know, uh, what is your thoughts on, uh, on this? Thank you. Again, your name, please. Uh, Peter Oliver. Peter. Hi. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you, Peter. Again, a fantastic question. You know, that question reminds me, uh, it takes me to the the concept of uh, nuclear deterrence, right? Uh, the whole, <laughs> this is this a very similar logic, right? So uh, we all need to possess nuclear weapons so that we can be safe, you know, we can safeguard ourselves and our citizens. It's the same reasons why uh, guns are so popular in the US, right? That we need to protect our children from guns. So now, we need to not only possess guns ourselves, we need to give teachers guns also. We understand that that logic doesn't have, you know, doesn't merit much consideration. I, I think, you know, except for a few nations like Bhutan, maybe, or Tibet, I think most nation states are say, safeguarding their own personal interests. Well, whatever we say, the US, you know, trying to be the big... Um, player in the world politics. I think at the end of the day, except for a few nation states, like I said, like Bhutan uh, and others, I think we are safeguarding our own interests. So I don't think that that is an issue. I think the issue is, you know, how much more can we focus on education, which is um, unfortunately still lacking. You know, kids in the US, uh, the, the, the biggest reason, the biggest, um, cause of death for kids in the US is guns. Can you believe this? this? This is a crazy logic. An eye for an eye will make the whole world go blind. I can't help but quote Gandhi again. So I, I, I really don't think that we are, um, you know, I think I think we need to expand our consciousness is where I think uh, we need to go forward from this. Maybe not the answer you were expecting, but I do think that, uh, Dialogue and consensus is what we need. That may be a difficult question for a country like Ukraine, not for an American citizen, not for an American citizen. If he has a question, we'll just uh, give him a... Oh, uh... Can you open your mic, uh, Anthony? Uh, yeah. Hi, you hear oh, me? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great, wonderful. Uh, first, uh, foremost, thank you very much for this whole presentation. It was uh, very educational. I've learned a lot. And um, actually, uh, my question is sort of like an opposite to uh, Pierre Olivier's question. 
Um, first, I feel embarrassed because the uh, video that you showed us, I, I didn't know about it at all, about how like the West tried to demonize uh, Turkey, for example. I didn't know about that. And I didn't know either that there was like this British writer which tried to like show another narrative of how things really were for them. And as much for him as for uh, Isaac Ikeda, as for Gandhi, it feels like for such a change to happen, as, you're, as you were stating, a sort of inner revolution has to happen within the individual. And there seems to be a common trend like all these individuals have this sort of capacity to just like brush off a little bit the 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 backlash that they are going to receive because like that British guy, of course, uh, since he tried to push another narrative that was the most completely opposed to the dominant one, people like he, he lost his job basically because of it. And in this modern era where pretty much everyone is judged based on his ideals and his values more than his action. How can you build this type of strength to just, when you know, when you feel that this narrative is like rightful to keep pushing and not like get too, too, um, too afraid to receive the backlash. That's amazing. Gosh, that's, that's an amazing question. So to me, that question really is about, you know, how do we keep hope alive, right? How do we keep hope alive? It's, it's really a challenging question to respond to because on one hand, one can come up with a list of things, you know, <laughs> that we can do, you know, do this, talk to that one, be part of a community, read some good literature. There is all of that. But I do feel that um, there is, you know, there is um, a certain amount of frustration. And for people like Gandhi, Ikeda, Maki Gucci, Toda, mm -hmm. you know, um, going to prison was something which was part and parcel of fighting for human rights. And of course, with us, I think uh, across, uh, you know, Canada, US, uh, Japan, or those of us joining, uh, uh, I don't know where you are situated, Anthony, but I suppose you are also in Canada right now. You know, so for us, uh, living in modern democratic nation states uh, that allow us to freely express ourselves, uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, um, being incarcerated is not something we are worried about. But these thinkers that I quoted today have all uh, run the risk of, uh, you know, giving up their lives in a sense, right, uh, for this. So hope is not just, you know, being like Pollyanna type. This optimistic, radical hope requires for us to really go through the fires. Um, and whatever that means in our personal circumstances, I think, um, is, is the commitment that we have to be prepared to take, you know. And I think youth really, to me, you know, learning from Dr. Ikeda, I think youth really is the time where we can forge this inner determination and commitment because later on, it becomes even more challenging to do that. So how can we forge you know, um, ourselves in, in our youth, but also, as Dr. Ikeda says, uh, hardships can become the crucible in which we forge our you know, inner determination in ourselves. And I think using our hardships, whatever our personal individual hardships are to do that, because just reading books or, you know, um, you know, engaging with positive minded people is not enough when things get really bad. And if we are doing the right thing, things should get really bad at some point in our lives. Then we know that we are on the right path to creating change. Yeah, that's a wonderful answer. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry for my uh, low tone voice. I'm kind of exhausted. Uh, out of a training camp. So uh, sorry for my low energy type of vibe, but uh, thank you yeah. very much for your answer. Thank you for joining. I really appreciate it. My God, I, like I said, I appreciate everybody joining on a Friday evening, you know, from uh, the very busy lives that we have. You must be coming to the end of the term as well. So a lot of assignments piling up at your end. So I very much appreciate it. 
<laughs> Good to reconnect. <laughs> Hi, I don't know if you see me. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, actually, um, uh, I don't really have a question. I just want to thank you very much because, uh, but yeah, I do have one question actually. <laughs> um, you were talking, you were linking the inner transformation to uh, actually the um, and the, and the dialogue between uh, countries to a possible peace that I find it kind of uh, find of, I find it kind of difficult to to link those two. Um, do we consider uh, a state as someone specific as like an entity? Can we compare it to someone? Can we compare it to a human? Because we have emotions, we we react towards stuff with our emotions, but. Can we apply the same logic to a state and be like, oh, this is anger. This is why, like, they had this, uh, this, the, the, actually, the, the competition that you were, uh, you were talking about. So yeah, that's my question. <laughs> Thank you, and, and your name, please, Tanya. <laughs> Tanya. Okay, great, perfect. Thank you, Tanya. That's a, that's, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> To be honest, that's a difficult question. It's something I will have uh, all questions as well. I will really have to think about these, you know, more in depth. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely, I think every nation has a different disposition. Um, you know, I do think that every nation has a different disposition. There's no doubt about that. The competition which Maki Gucci talked about is a humanitarian competition. Um, how would you describe a nation? You know, so I think I'll go back to what um, Ikeda mentions that there is an African view, there is an Asian view, you know. I think it is also to do with whatever's going on in that nation state, but also in that regional, uh, you know, state, for example, in terms of not just people's emotions, but in terms of levels of poverty, abuses of human right, you know, access to uh, basic necessities. What are people going through in that nation state that uh, I think largely determines um, how quickly or not, you know, they can get to a state where they can come together, you know, uh, as, as a polity. But these things are really tricky. These things are really tricky. I mean, in when you again look at the case of the Kenyan Green Belt movement, I mean, look at India. These countries were able to use, uh, you know, their hardships uh, to bring about effective change. One thing, though, in common, uh, you know, to the individual, the nation state, regional, uh, you know, uh, sort of um, modes of competition, I think, is a values-based perspective. So what do I mean by that? And this is something I'm really interested in. There is this huge focus in education across global modern nation states to, you know, focus on the cognitive element, behavioral element. So how can we foster active global citizens, you know, who can take action based on knowledge? But what about the values that the learners bring into the classroom? You know, so there is this British sociologist called Bernstein and Bernstein or Bernstein. Um, he basically, Basil Bernstein says that the values and interests that the students, you know, bring into the school are dropped off at the school gates. So basically, we fail to engage as educators and schools and institutions of learning with the values and perceptions and interests of the learners to the extent that we need to. It's easy to engage with the cognitive. Here, take an exam, do the test, write a critical essay. You know, here, go take part in your community, project-based learning. You know, so there is a huge thrust on the social, emotional, and the behavioral, but not on the values-based. So how do we engage with values-based perspectives within the classroom? So I'll point you to this particular thinker, and I'm going to end there. 
because you uh, must be in def desperate need of caffeine or food. <laughs> and it's coming up to 6.30 at our end here uh, in North America. So I think on that brilliant note and pointing you to look at by, uh, you know Bernstein's work, I think I will end there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Ainamrata seems to be the end for us just uh, right now. You know. Would you be with us in uh, Tokyo next uh, next year? we on the circuit. <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> because we, we envision something great. The last time was just incredible, you know. So, wow. if we can be together next year, it will be just great. We will have a chance to talk about that, but we spent a lot of exchange with soccer students. It was great. It was really great. Wow. And we miss you. Me too. Me too. <laughs> I missed that. It's so lovely to see your faces again. Okay. Thank you, Namrata, again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll be in touch. I'll be on audio for the rest of the conference uh, seminar, but we'll yeah, be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.